I'm Charlie Hudson. I am not a doctor or a medical professional. I do have a website, uh, and I make videos for people. So if that is a conflict of interest, there it is. And you like to dance. I, and I like to dance. And there we go. OK, so there's a lot of talk in ancestral circles about functional movement, crawling, swimming, running, jumping, throwing, catching. Oh, I guess we're not going to have sound. But this is not functional movement. <laughs> so <clears throat> I'm going to be making the case today for extravagance and extravagance in motion. So I'm interested in how our modern uh, dance practices uh, have developed out of, uh, from our ancestors. Uh, and so I'm going to start uh, broadly talking about movements that might be described as dance in the, in the wider animal kingdom. And that means I'll talk about signaling theory. Then I'm going to talk about movements uh, entrained to an external rhythm, animals that are keeping the beat. And then uh, I'll uh, speculate a bit about the significance of dance for our ancestors. And I'll finally I'll wrap up um, with uh, the limited data that there is about dance as an intervention. So dance is a wasteful extravagance. It takes time and calories. It requires significant investment to become proficient. And it often competes with sleep, which we know is critical to peak performance. And maybe this is the point. So these are garden follies. These are uh, fake ruins that rich people will build on their land. And it is sometimes said that the perfect garden folly is the one that drives you bankrupt, because to go bankrupt shows that you can make the money back another day. These are springboks, and they will do this behavior called stodding, where they spring almost straight up in the air. And they can't change direction while they're in the air, and they can't really cover that much ground. And they will do this even as predators chase them, because if you are a lion or a cheetah chasing something that's so energetic that it figures it can waste some energy springing straight up in the air, you're going to give up and you're going to chase an older, more tired gazelle. <laughs> so this is uh, from a paper from Zahavi in the 70s. He called this uh, handicap theory. And basically, if you have uh, a lot of vitality, but you don't have a way of showing it, there's no way for a potential mate um, to see that you have it. So essentially, you have to waste. You have to spend some of that vitality. Um, and, and again, there is, there is this cost here. So here's the quality, and there's the sexually selected character. You, you waste some of that vitality, but now your potential mates know that you have some to waste. This is from uh, Thorstein Veblen, I believe was his name, in 1899, Theory of the Leisure Class. Such immaterial evidences of past leisure are quasi-scholarly or quasi-artistic accomplishments. <clears throat> Here is courtship behavior in Grebes. The wasteful extravagance. So dance is a costly signal. By investing time and energy, we signal allegiance to our culture. By staying up all night, we signal to our friends that bonding with them is a priority over going to work the next day. And through dancing, we can demonstrate things like empathy, coordination, power, stamina, etc. So now talking about dancing to a beat. So this parrot was the first animal whose entrainment to music was formally studied. Um, so he had a favorite song, and they took that song, and they sped it up, and they slowed it down. And they did this to prove that he, would, he hadn't just memorized the tempo, that he was actually sticking to the beat of the music, in which he was. 
although he did appear to prefer uh, the tempos faster than the original. Uh, so who can keep a beat? They reviewed uh, as many videos of animals described as dancing on YouTube as they could. And there were 14 more species demonstrating entrainment. This is not one of them. So this is super cute, but if you watch closely, the dog isn't really on the beat. So all 15 species um, that were entrained to music were vocal mimics. 14 species of parrots and Asian elephants. And so I'm going to go fast through this. Uh, there appears to be some cognitive and social aspects to that. Then an exception turned up. <laughs> but it may not be an exception because seals and walruses are both known vocal mimics. And uh, so sea lions share a common ancestor. So it, it may be uh, an ability retained from a common ancestor that was a vocal mimic. This is, I wish I could have found a better video, but this is the only video of Cooney that I could find. She's a bonobo. And both Cooney, I mentioned that Snowball preferred the faster tempos. The same was true with Cooney. She synchronized more often to um, near her preferred tempo of 270 beats a minute. And young children and older adults also have less capacity to entrain to rhythms that are far outside of their preferred tempos. So that, uh, of course, raises the question, what is the preferred tempo in humans? And it appears that somewhere around 120 beats per minute is the preferred tempo in humans. And we entrain best to tempos, again, between 106 and 130 beats per minute. And it seems to match uh, the preferred tempo in Western music, which is around 125 beats per minute. And these, these are a whole range of activities. The blue uh, you see there is the z-axis. They put motion trackers on people's hats and blue is going up and down. And so these are things like walking, stairs, uh, even cleaning the apartment. You see that peak of around 120 beats per minute. So we could say that humans prefer human music. So uh, of course, once you start talking about uh, hominid development uh, and culture, you get uh, pretty far into the weeds of speculation. Um, but some of the things that may have uh, influenced music and dance. Uh, we'll go through our bipedalism, extended early childhood, hypersociability, cooperative aggression and intimidation, increasingly complex communication, and increasingly complex culture. So bipedalism. Uh, we tend, when we walk together, to sync our steps to the people around us. And we will do this um, unintentionally and unconsciously. And so one of the theories is that if everybody's walking, is stepping at the same time, everyone's making sound at the same time, and then there's a period of relative quiet. So if we're in sync, we can better uh, have a better audio picture of our environment because we know when that sound is coming, and then we know when we'll be able to hear. Earlier birth and the need to engage caregivers and soothe infants. So infants. Uh, and humans obviously are, um, are much less able than most other animals when we're born. And so they need to engage their caregivers to have any shot. And the caregivers um, need to encourage the infants um, or support their growing brains. And so you get this um, relationship development through motion in part, right? Babies like to be rocked. And we, we, again, at the bottom of this quote, we smile back. It's not a need or ability that humans outgrow. 
contact calls. So contact calls are sounds that social animals make, like chicken clucks, baboon grunts, even the sounds of eating. And contact calls communicate safety. Uh, and when the chicken stops clucking and stands still, the other hens around her also stop. That's a signal that there may be something they need, need to worry about. So if the sounds cease, that communicates danger. And humming and lullabies and things like that may serve a similar function. Okay, this is uh, musical universals, don't have time to get into this, but basically um, music performed in human groups usually has a rhythm, and there are two ways that that is typically achieved, either through syllabic singing, so everybody's singing on the same syllable, or percussion instrumentation. Uh, and the point, one of the, the functions that that serves is to uh, synchronize performances. And this acting together, um, synchronizing our music and our dance, um, actually has a bonding effect which has been measured. This was a study uh, done in Brazil uh, with groups of three, and they measured, um, the graph is not totally, uh, it's not the most communicative, um, but basically they were measuring four um, states, either, uh, they were either high exertion or low exertion, and synchronized or partially synchronized. And uh, no surprise, um, it was expected that um, high exertion, uh, I forgot to mention, uh, so they are measuring both uh, by survey how bonded they are to group members and outgroup members, and then by pain threshold uh, as a proxy for endorphin levels. So they expected endorphin levels to rise with high exertion they also found that high exertion um, bonds you to people in your group. But also synchronization um, bonds you to people in your group, whether or not you're high uh, exertion, although it helps a little bit more to have both. And it's also been shown, again, that, that synchronizing movements um, gives uh, intentionally synchronizing movements to start increases subconscious mirroring uh, later on. So people bond when they synchronize. Priming with music making increases pro-social behavior in children. Basically the white here is cooperative playing and the dark is individual play mode. So they designed this experiment with German children. Uh, there were two ways to perform this task that they had to complete before they could go play a game they really wanted to play. Cooperative mode was faster. Uh, and individual mode was slower, and they either had uh, musical priming or group exercise priming. And they had to split it, females and males, because females were just more cooperative to start with. Um, but you see that the music um, making helped both groups, and there was another exercise uh, whether they would assist a playmate whose equipment was designed to fail. Uh, this is a little bit uh, mushier because there's five different categories, but basically the lighter stuff up top is helpful and the darker stuff down below is less helpful. And again, the music making made people more, help, made uh, infants uh, more helpful. And then you get to body language. So the area of our brain responsible for sending signals uh, is also where mirror neurons fire when we watch someone use a tool. So there's this intimate connection between language use and uh, learning, uh, you know, visual learning. So that suggests that the first symbols that human used, humans used were patterns of bodily movement. And so perhaps that's the most fundamental form of communication, and dance taps into that. This one really interests me, recall and ancestral cultures. So an oral culture has no texts. How does it get together organized material for recall? So oral cultures have very different, they don't speak the same way that, that literate people speak. Your thought must come into being in heavily rhythmic, balanced patterns, in repetitions or antitheses, in alliterations and assonances, in epithetic and other formulary expressions. If you, if you thought of something in another way, you wouldn't remember it, so what would be the point? So dance provides another hook by which you can pull back important 
cultural knowledge. So along with things like meter, rhyme, tune, context, etc. Uh, I'm not going to get into this study very much, but basically, uh, I love this quote, rituals are a way to transfer feelings to others. And it appears that music uh, can convey emotions uh, universally, although not perfectly. So cooperative intim uh, intimidation and aggression. Human violence is usually done in groups, and combat parties are more effective when individuals are coordinated, disciplined, and dedicated to the group. And if you, again, going back to signaling theory, if you have a display that can signal these strengths, it might make actual physical confrontation unnecessary. So here we have... All Blacks Haka. <clears throat> and actually, because, again, we've seen that doing synchronized movement together uh, increases bonding, increases uh, mirroring and coordination, doing something like this before uh, combat might actually improve uh, group performance. So now we're going to be talking about the health considerations. We've been dancing for a long time, so by the ancestral heuristic, we should expect people to respond well to interventions involving dance. But a caveat, uh, there's not been a lot of study, and the things that uh, have been studied, uh, there weren't standardized interventions, and they're mostly small sample sizes. But let's talk about some features of dance that might be beneficial. It provides a structure and context, uh, so that is both in terms of uh, the rhythm and then also the, the cultural context. Um, people have these traditions that they can, you can layer things onto. Stimulates beneficial responses such as social bonds and, uh, and it's more thoroughly engaging in a whole number of ways, mentally, physically, socially. And people enjoy it. And because they enjoy it, you usually have higher retention and compliance. So for instance, um, Parkinson's patients, uh, the use of rhythm, either, both with walking and also in a small Argentine tango study, uh, appears to be quite helpful um, in the treatment of Parkinson's, and that may be because the auditory stimulus may be bypassing a dysfunctional basal ganglia. In a case study, uh, of a patient with Alzheimer's, multiple comorbidities, and recurrent falls, uh, she, they would give her these instructions for salsa dancing, and she would forget them every time. Um, but because of her cultural background, she picked it up every time, and she actually got better at the motions, even though uh, she would forget the instructions uh, pretty much immediately afterwards. And she was more compliant because she enjoyed, enjoyed it. Uh, a study of waltz for chronic heart failure patients. Uh, they alternated fast and slow waltzes. And that was, uh, when they looked at the data later, they found that it elicited a heart rate response closely resembling interval training. Uh, and that's probably, of course, the original interval training, right, is, is with fast and slow songs. And again, better compliance. It promotes, pro uh, promotes bonding and prosocial behavior. It's been demonstrated in toddlers, young adults, and elderly patients with dementia. And of course, if you're working with toddlers every day in daycare, that's important. And if you're working in residential care, again, that can be very valuable. It's more engaging physically. People exert themselves more with musical stimulus, surprising no one. Uh, risk reduction for cardiovascular disease was greater for moderate intensity dancing than for walking and it's also been shown to be effective at improving balance. This one was really interesting, and, and it's, um, it was an observational study, but they did have more subjects. So they followed a 21-year observational study, followed 469 subjects. Mental activity was generally more correlated with brain health. Um, this isn't general health, but brain health um, than all physical activities except dance. So things like reading, playing board games, and playing musical instruments uh, were associated with lower risk of dementia. Dance was the only physical activity 
that was associated with lower risk, and it outperformed everything else in the study. Uh, it's really hard to read there, um, but the, the point, um, some, this is somebody commenting on the study. Um, basically, there's a lot of, in social dancing, there's a lot of split-second decision-making, both in the lead and the follow roles, and so maybe that's part of it. But of course, also the social stimulation, uh, and the, uh, as well as you know, the exercise, and there's a whole lot of things going on. As I said, it's more socially engaging. In a Latin dance program for balance, um, they, they found a high proportion of men had signed up. Uh, it was more women than men, but more men than you typically get in an exercise program for the elderly. Um, they didn't really know why. The, the, the data um, you know, didn't say anything conclusive. I liked this little tidbit later. Psychosocial survey results show an important and statistically significant improvement in sexual activity and sleep quality. Uh, and they also found improved psychosocial measures uh, in the WALTZ study. And again, people enjoy it, so they keep doing it. Uh, high compliance and retention rates have been found. Dance exercise for women with diabetes, uh, women, uh, residential care, WALTZ patients, the Tango study. So people enjoy it, and they keep doing it. Uh, and just one final thought to leave you with, um, re-expanding the definition of dance. Um, so if we think of uh, medicine operating on a ritual structure, and remember that the quote about uh, rituals are a way to transfer feelings to another person, to other people, um, then what, what role uh, can that ritual of medicine, um, the ritual itself, play? And that is my talk. Any questions? I, want, I wanted to mention just one more thing. Um, the exercise apparently also helped to, uh, was really effective. Uh, in prevention of Alzheimer's disease, more effective than other types of exercises. Yeah. Yeah. Nina will be. Nina will be after this. Yes. I just wanted to comment. Um, as many of you who are parents know, kids have science fair projects, and um, for many years I did obstetrics, and so one of my kids, uh, we worked together on a science fair project which we called um, the fetus and music. And so um, we did different kinds of music with the fetuses and uh, recorded the heartbeats. And there was such clear variance, you know, and, but it was consistent with the different types of music and how it affected the heartbeat. I mean, we are so programmed through music. It, it starts in utero. It, it's, it's, it's so amazing. I've seen toddlers, as soon as they can stand up, they go with the beat. And they actually they have a routine, like a one-year-old, and they sway with the music, and they actually pound with the music at, by age one. It's it's just in our genes. There's no question. We are programmed that way. So um, it's a little off topic, but yeah, like I have a good sheet on like she's on the teachers also. He's a also integrated medicine practitioner, yeah. and he actually prescribes dance because he says it works with the meridian system. Uh -huh. and actually helps with the breath work. Movement, all gets the circulation of chi flowing through different meridian points. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's complex, complex motion. motion. Yeah, yeah I, think that's, I think that's a very interesting point. Uh, I actually looked at this from the physical activity point of view, and, yeah. uh, especially with play. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons why dance is so potent is because, uh, as a movement form, is because of the complexity of the movements and the coordination aspects of the movements. You're creating neurogenesis, which is why. So it, doesn't, it isn't just about that you're dancing, it's about that you're undertaking often new movement patterns that you're not familiar with. Yeah. You have to actually learn and improve those movement patterns over time. Yeah, and, and with, with social dancing, dancing you, are, you, 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 have, you may be doing, doing the same steps, but you have a different partner. partner. So you, it changes every time. time. Yeah. And if, if it's in tempo, right. uh, then obviously it depends in terms of who's leading. Right. So yeah, it's very fantastic uh, presentation. Thank you. Just like, just like Tai Chi and Yoga, we're trying to partner with physical therapists, you know, the dance therapists, to actually feel where they are, the master mm. of dance, you know, there's a certain amount of clinical um, apprenticeship you go with in the practice. You just sort of sense where the food is going, and how they're going to try to follow the yoga movement, 
I, yeah, I mean, it does seem like some of the some of the papers that I was going through have um, sort of there are a few different therapeutic dance um, uh, uh, programs that people have made, and then you can get certified in those. But the, but some of the studies were just like they had brought in an Ar Argentine tango instructor, or they they just played waltz and they just taught them simple waltz. So some of them are very structured, and you get your certification, and some of them are just like, woo, we're going to go do it. Yeah, and that was again in the in the review um, paper that that was one of the things they mentioned is every, there was you know nobody's studying a standardized intervention it's a whole bunch of different things.